Hello, everyone. On behalf of Shaw Contract, thank you each for joining us today. Shaw Contract's mission is to build a foundation for spaces that empower people to act on their power for positive change, and ultimately to make a smarter impact in all that you do. You will see this shared mission come to life during this panel discussion today as we explore how a school building can act as a 3D textbook. We are delighted to have guests from the Green Schools National Network, which we are a proud supporter of, and also from Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Our guests will share their work with co-creating sustainable environments that truly impact the end user of the space, the staff, the teachers, and the students who, under normal circumstances, would be in these environments each day. To set the stage, we have a video that will illustrate this important work that the Green Schools National Network and Virginia Beach City Public Schools have embarked upon. At the Green Schools National Network, we believe that sustainability is the driver of innovation in K-12 schools. With a particular emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion, our mission is to create learning environments that are engaging and welcoming to everyone. Our Catalyst Network schools and school districts are becoming demonstration sites to help others learn how to prepare students to co-create a sustainable future. The network comprises 200 schools in 13 states, including Virginia Beach City Public Schools. For more than a decade, Virginia Beach has prioritized ecological stewardship. The commitment started by erecting LEED-certified buildings to reduce their ecological footprint and operating costs. Today, as their square footage of beautiful 21st century schools continues to increase, their utility budgets and carbon footprint continues to decrease. In the summer of 2016, they held their first Sustainability Leadership Summit. Guided by the question, is the way we're doing things now the best way forward financially, environmentally, and for our community? By the end of the summit, they had brainstormed more than 40 ways they could implement more sustainable practices and set a course to transform their instructional program, their food system, and their transportation system. Today, their instructional program focuses on creating classrooms where students collaborate, think critically, and problem solve to address authentic tasks built around their own personal interests. Protecting human and ecological health is now embedded in the coursework of the Environmental Leadership Academy. This unique high school program bridges the social sciences, engineering, and traditional sciences with innovative technologies and entrepreneurship. Some of the courses being piloted in this program have the potential to be replicated at any of 11 high schools. At Old Donation School, place, project, and problem-based learning provide opportunities for students to engage in authentic work for their community from grades two through eight. The experiential learning strategies at ODS are becoming a model for the other 66 elementary and middle schools in the district. In the kitchens across the district, the lunchroom staff are being re-educated to scratch cook whole fresh foods. The district chef is also working with students and teachers in planning and taste testing new recipes that are helping everyone to rethink what they eat and where their food comes from. And while buildings are the biggest greenhouse emitter, transportation was a close second. With the development of the Virginia Beach City Public Schools 2019 Emissions Reduction Plan and Report, the city has developed a plan to reduce fuel consumption by 50% by the year 2050. All of these innovations demonstrate how sustainability is driving innovation in the Virginia Beach City Public Schools Division. The Green Schools National Network is proud to have them as a partner as we continue to do the hard work to bring everyone into the conversation and leverage the resources necessary to educate faculty, staff, and students across the country to co-create a sustainable future. So as we get started in learning more about that fantastic work, um, I have the privilege of introducing you all to Jennifer Seidel, who is a dear friend, a sustainability advocate, a self-proclaimed and an industry known rebel rouser, and of course, the executive director for the Green Schools National Network. Jenny. Thank you, Michelle. I'm honored to join you today. 
I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Shaw Contract for your support over the years. We are a better organization because of our partnership with you. Welcome to those of you that are joining us. We have an amazing panel for you today to share a sustainability success story in K-12 education. Over the next 45 minutes, our guests from Virginia Beach City Public Schools will share with you some of the lessons they have learned in their decades long journey toward creating a healthy, equitable and sustainable school division. As a founding member of GSNN's Catalyst Network, they demonstrate how visionary leadership and a belief that students are not only leaders today, but will be the influencers who shape the policies and innovations of the 22nd century and beyond. Joining us by phone is Superintendent of the School Division, Aaron Spence. Dr. Spence grew up in the Virginia Beach area playing in the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. His commitment to making his hometown a better place brought him back to Virginia Beach in 2014 after serving in leadership roles in North Carolina and Texas. As the superintendent, he oversees the operation of 86 schools serving 69,000 students. Also with us today is Tim Cole, the sustainability officer for Virginia Beach. City Public Schools. Tim was instrumental in the development of the first LEED certified elementary school in Virginia. He has since led the charge in constructing over 1.6 million square feet of LEED building space in Virginia Beach. Under his leadership, the district was selected as the 2012 best green school district in the United States by the US Green Buildings Council. Next is Dr. Kelly Hedrick. Kelly is the principal of Old Donation School, um, a K-12, or excuse me, a K-8 school in Virginia Beach. Dr. Hedrick has worked as a classroom teacher at the elementary and middle school levels, taught in a gifted center-based program, served as a middle school gifted resource teacher, and as a central office curriculum and instruction program leader. She jumped at the opportunity to be principal at ODS so she could put into practice all of the things that she had learned over her career to create the best school possible. When you hear the story of ODS, you will understand that she believes in education for the gifted for everyone. Also with us is Chris Freeman who received the Presidential Innovation Award for Environmental Educators in 2016. After many years of challenging his 11th and 12th grade students to address real world problems through thoughtful discourse, idea generation, experimentation, and collaboration, Chris stepped into the leadership role designing the curriculum for the new Environmental Studies program. He will share with you how the academy empowers students to make a difference in their community by becoming engaged environmental students as they devise solutions for their community. Last but not least, I would like to introduce you to Latanya Hopkins. Latanya is an 11th grade student at Bayside High School in Virginia Beach. She is also an important part of the first cohort of students at the environmental studies program. She is a gymnast, a singer, and a scientific thinker with a steadfast determination to make the world a better place. Latanya, thank you very much for being with us. We're super excited to have a student on our panel today. So we're gonna kick off our conversation today with um, a question and conversation a little bit with Tim Cole. Um, Tim, um, we saw a little bit about Virginia Beach City Public Schools um, in the video, um, but we know that you've been, I, I'm going to call you a rabble rouser as well. You've been one of the chief rabble rousers in Virginia Beach leading the sustainability initiatives. Um, so could you give us a little bit of an overview on how um, you got where you are as a leader in the green, healthy, sustainable schools movement, both as an individual and as a school district. What motivated you, what was excited you, and why are you sitting here as an expert on our panel today 
And then what were the early goals and practices that shaped um, decision making related to the built environment and who was involved and what standards guided your work? Okay, thanks, Jenny. So um, let's see, I, I think the way I got involved with this was when I worked in private practice, my background is architecture. So when I worked in private practice back in the 90s, we had a client come in and they wanted us to design a building for them around this uh, LEED criteria and LEED was a pilot program at the time. And so that's where I first got initiated into that. And then about uh, 20 years ago when I came to work for the school division, uh, they had been building elementary school prototypes all around the, the city and we talked about maybe tweaking one of those to see uh, how difficult it would be to get a LEED certification for that. And so uh, we did that and Hermitage Elementary School became the first LEED certified elementary school in the, in the state of Virginia. And so from that point on, we really started focusing on buildings and all the new buildings, what we had to do to, uh, to meet this LEED certification. We, we, we like third party certifications. It takes a lot of the guesswork out, uh, out for us, even when you're talking about green seal being for products that you might clean a building with to green guard being products that you might buy to go in a building like furniture. So we like third party certifications. And it's so, so it all started with us with the, the built environment. And uh, you know, it kind of expanded from there into uh, other avenues. Okay, we've got, the, we've got the built environment kind of under control. We're moving in the right direction. And so I, we think this is a good example for students to look at to see what we're doing, you know, how, how we lead by example in this. And then it branched out from that into kind of uh, how do you, what are our practices within the school division? How do we make sure all the departments within the school division are thinking about this as well? And then a kind of a third goal for us was how do you educate the public about that? And so it all has kind of grown from that and it's morphed into sustainability being much larger than just the built environment and really kind of encompassing this idea around the triple bottom line about how do we uh how do we make the triple bottom line decision process part of everything that we do how do we measure social economic and environmental outcomes and everything that we look at as a school division and so that's really been our our goal moving forward uh from a sustainability perspective and so what we found interesting was in the very beginning of this, uh, we didn't really tell anybody what we were doing. You don't have to tell people you're building a lead building. You know, a lead is still a uh, lead back then or anything revolving around a, a sustainable building was very political. Uh, it's still somewhat political, you know, in some arenas, but it was very political then. So we weren't asking for more money to, to build buildings this way. We were building within our budgets. So uh, we found it best just not to talk about it. Why, why bring any controversy into it? So we started building buildings this way. We started getting a certain amount of success from that. And then once we started building a successful program, nobody could really make arguments about it. We weren't spending more money to do it. So then we can move forward with things like creating a school board policy that talked about things like buildings and the way we build buildings and a particular policy around uh, sustainability initiatives. So that's kind of how we got started right there. And that's how we've gotten into it. Uh, did that answer your question, Jenny? Yeah, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about um, the use of third party certifications. I think um, you mentioned the triple bottom line in decision making and how the third party is helping simplify some of your decision making. Could you talk a little bit about that and what what is the benefit of those 30 third party certifications in your in your world as you make decisions on the built environment? So when we opened our first lead building, uh, we really hadn't thought about what takes place in the building after after we open a, a lead building like that. And so went into that building the, the first summer and realized that they were stripping the floors the same way we'd stripped them in every school that we do every summer every window was open ammonia was going onto the floor it was a really nasty environment so so we started looking at what do we have to do to make sure the chemicals that are going into the building are maintaining the indoor air quality that we had when we first opened the building and and that's where we really started looking at uh, aside from just the lead process being a third-party certification how do we kind of expand our horizons when it comes to third-party certification so we did a pilot program where we pulled all the chemicals out of the building and we went with a uh, the third party at the time, the strongest one is Green Seal, when you talk about cleaning products, and probably still is. 
So we replaced all of our products with Green Seal certified products to kind of see what would be involved in cleaning the building. If it was going to be more expensive, it was, if they weren't going to work as well. And we found that they actually worked uh, as well or better than the chemicals we had been using all the time. So, so we started with our cleaning products, having a third, uh, third party certification. And then we started looking hard at the furniture that went into the buildings and the materials and, uh, and what kind of third party certifications were out there looking at that stuff. And Green Guard at the time was the primary one. I think they still are a really good one for looking at for third party certifications. And it takes the guesswork out of it for us. We're not experts in all of this stuff. So we rely on other people to be the experts. We just looked around to see who the, who the big players were. And, uh, and that's the direction that we've gone with on all these things from the built environment to the, the furniture that we use. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, the um, leadership and vision that it takes to pull all of these things together is is um, reflected in the new environmental studies program that has been launched um, at the Brock Center where LaTanya attends. And so LaTanya, I'm gonna shift um, the conversation to you. And again, I wanna thank you very much um, for joining us. Um, it's always great to have a student be able to talk about their experience and, and what they've learned in school, um, especially in a school related to sustainability. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you ended up at the um, high school program, the environmental studies program, um, any experiences that shaped you um, as a budding scientist and helped you make this big decision? Um, well, when I was 13 months, I was burned and I had second and third degree burns, which covered 40% of my body. Um, my face was burnt so bad that it was unrecognizable and my throat was slashed. The um, surgery that was performed was a tracheotomy so that I couldn't breathe. And in addition to that, I coated blue. Um, and since then, I've been through numerous of uh, skin grafting surgeries. And the doctor's telling me that I'll never be the same or I'll never walk again or I'll never talk again or never interact with other children. It just shapes me to be the strong person. And I tell you this story, not for you to pity me, but to show you that I am strong. And yes, my circumstances did not hold me back. I went forward with life and also, I found the love of science and music and science and music is my therapy. So that's how I came about in life and it shaped me to be a strong person. And then I found out about this program. And when I saw it, it was like amazing to me. Like when I first saw it on the card, I was like, wow, this center is big. So this looks like something I can be a part of and, you know, make a difference in the world. Great. So um, the choices that you make in middle school and high school really shape your career path, um, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, have you set your sights on a career path and um, how is being a, a student at, in the environmental studies program supporting your goals? Well, when I had to apply for being in the AP environmental studies program, um, on the application it asked me, it said, how can this program um, help you get to the career that you need to get to. And looking at that question, it kind of forced me to make a decision on what I want to be in life. So I did some research and I searched up scientific jobs because I know I wanted to do something in science, but I just didn't know yet. So I came across this career is called a toxologist. And when I saw it, I was like, wow, this is something I want to be like, I've never heard of it. So it could be something that I can brag about. So being in this program, I have access to the tool called Aero Quality Series 500. Uh, it's an air qualifying sensor. So being in this program, I can use that and solve problems in Virginia Beach now with the air and things. So I'll basically be doing toxology work, just don't have the good degree yet. So when I finish with this, I can just go out there and get the degree and already be a toxologist before I even become it. So this program will help a lot with me and the career that I chose. Great, so really um, hands-on experience, something that is important to you? 
Yes, I'm much better learn when I have like hands on, you know, with this virtual stuff, it's different, but being hands on with things, it just gives you more focus and you're more into it. So great. yes. Great. Thanks, Latanya. Um, yeah. That's great. And we'll come back to you, I'm sure, after a question or two later. So um, Aaron, um, you're joining us by phone. Um, you get to do the heavy lifting um, to carry the vision of sustainability forward and infuse it into all aspects of the district. Um, so as a, as a returning, as a young person who was educated in Virginia Beach and returning now as the superintendent, that's pretty impressive. Um, so how did the work um, that was happening under Tim's leadership inspire you to come back? Um, and what have you done to expand on it? And how, what have you learned as a leader in this expansion? Yeah, well, thank you and, uh, and good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me okay. <clears throat> Um, I, um, as was noted, I, I grew up in the city and, uh, you know, water is an important part of my life, fishing and surfing and, and, uh, just swimming and, and all of that. And so, uh, we're a water city. If you ever pull up a map of Virginia beach, all you have to do is look, I mean, we just, there's threads of water all the way through our city from the Elizabeth river over on the Western border to the bay on the east and the, uh, on the north and the Atlantic ocean on the east and all the inlets and creeks and rivers. Uh, that come with that and so um you know interest in in understanding our environment and in understanding how to protect it it just kind of comes i think naturally for many of us that grow up at the beach coming back as a school leader um was a little different we were I, we're very blessed uh, i'll just be candid we're very blessed to have tim cole in virginia beach he is a a voice nationally for um sustainability but certainly a real leader in our community and in our school division, and, and, and we had early conversations about what that work looks like. And obviously, um, I was very proud of and pleased with the the construction that was going on when I got here, which included the Old Donation School um, and the opportunity to look at that and see how it was being leveraged as a tool for learning, not just a, a facility that would uh, provide economic return for us, which they do. Um, uh, but Tim and I, you know, had the opportunity to have a lot of conversations about how could we uh, ensure that, uh, that not only are we building facilities that are green, but that we are uh, embedding that in our curriculum in ways that are meaningful. And so we talk a lot about things like ha making sure all children have meaningful watershed experiences, making sure that all children have outdoor experiences. Um, and so, you know, wanting to continue that. And then beyond that, you know, the leadership at a school division level really expands across a number of different areas. So certainly instruction and curriculum facilities, but also, uh, you know, food services and transportation and purchasing and everything else that comes along with, uh, with being in a, in a large division. And so we were able to, to talk about bringing together all of those people for a summit that you were part of, as you know, and, um, the opportunity through that summit to really think about ourselves um and, the, and kind of the guiding question was listen our kids our students students like latanya if they hear us say sustainability is important that's one thing if they see us practice sustainability that's another right like it's you practice what you preach so that students believe you and understand that this is really an important way to live um, and to run an organization. And so um, the opportunity to look at, for example, um, bringing, uh, bringing together the first propane fleet for our school division and now uh, bringing in the first electric buses in our school division, um, looking at our uh, purchasing processes and making sure that we um, use both the, the legal processes that are required but allow for um, sustainable products for example like Tim was talking with the um, with the, the green seal on our cleaning products and then just uh, across the the rest of the division thinking about where are the other areas where we can have an impact on sustainability and 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 have an impact on that triple bottom line that Tim likes to talk about um, and you know for me the other part of coming back and I'll just say again you know leadership in this area for me is personal because the other part of coming back was that I, I also have kids here now. And um, for me, wanting to make sure that um, there's a Virginia beach for them to live in that's worth living in um, as we go down the road. And so 
the uh, the culminating thing that I know we're going to talk a little bit more about for me has been the opportunity to build a program uh, to to support the build the building of a program where we will build the next generation of environmental leaders. And I'm really, really excited about that um, as something that I think will be unique uh, in the country, but hopefully replicable so that many more people will follow um, Chris's lead. Great. So we've been talking about this triple bottom line um, that, um, and, and again, in a community of people who think about sustainability, that triple bottom line you know, is, is a common language we talk about. Um, it's defined in many ways. Um, it's uh, making decisions and living so that um, we are able, that, so that future generations can thrive. Um, and we do that by balancing um, decisions so that um, the environment, um, the social um, structures, the, the social capacity of our communities, when it comes to equity and justice are, are um, part of what we think about and um, that the economic decisions that we make, um, you, you mentioned purchasing. So, so it's the three E's, economics, environment, um, and equity. Some people call it people, profit, planet. Um, in the K-12 community, sustainability is not a common, is not something that everybody talks about when we talk about innovation and education. We talk a lot about technology and we talk a lot about pedagogy and we talk about budgets and we talk about keeping kids safe. How does, um, when you're talking with your peers, Aaron, about leadership um, and how you've incorporated this triple bottom line into your, in your, into your vision, um, how do you explain that to your peers? What recommendations do you have? What language do you have to use to help your peers understand that sustainability, this triple bottom line can drive innovation. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, the last word you used is a key part of the language that, that I talk about when I'm talking with my colleagues and it's that word innovation, because innovation is something that my colleagues are deeply interested and in, deeply engaged in. You know, how do we change the learning environment for students? And when you talk about the potential for um, really creating what, what Latanya was talking about, that kind of hands-on experiential learning, um, getting down into the into the uh, sort of nitty-gritty of understanding what's happening in our ecosystems within our community, and then how do we, um, uh, and the experiential learning having a purpose, and so how then do we make a difference in our own communities? I mean, I think that resonates with my colleagues, but I'll also be candid, so does the economic piece of this, right? So uh, Tim referenced the politics, and superintendents live in a political world, and so uh, often you'll hear uh, somebody say, and this is why I think Tim always makes the point, you'll hear somebody say, well, I couldn't get away with that in my community. We're too conservative, you know, and, and uh, Tim's fond of pointing out, and it's very true that Virginia Beach is a very conservative community. It's a Navy town uh, and, uh, and, and has a, a, a real core value of kind of conservative strength. Um, that said, when you can make the economic argument that we have added, and Tim can give you the numbers, but uh, you know, uh, millions of square feet to our um, facilities and have saved millions and millions of dollars in um, utility costs, for example, and energy costs. Um, and then you can connect that kind of economic impact to the the planet piece of that, right? So the environmental piece of that, which I, I think at this stage, people are realizing really is an important, uh, uh, the important conversation in terms of our future as a species. And so um, you know, we have that conversation with my peers and they begin to see that bigger picture form that you can both have a really interesting, innovative curricular experience for students at the same time having an economic impact uh, in your school division in a positive way and uh, really supporting um, young learners in ways that, that matter to all of us. Great. Excellent. I think that is one of the biggest challenges is to how do we explain this and and how do we um, grow the tent, grow the community of people who really understand this. Um, Kelly, um, do you get the joy of implementing this vision um, and this triple bottom line, you know, at the school level and have done, you know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time um, because of the 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 philosophy that you um, that you live um, as a leader and 
that is reflected in the school um, at Old Donations. So at ODS. So in a world um, where everybody thinks environmental education or sustainability education is an add-on, um, one of the things that you do so beautifully is that you integrate it um, into the existing curriculum. It's not something that happens once a year. It happens across the board at all grade levels. Um, can you share a little bit about what you're doing and um, how you have done this integration um, with PLACE project and problem-based learning? I'm happy to, Jenny. So a couple of things that we've worked on here that are absolutely uh, doable in other places is we haven't treated sustainability as an add-on. We've treated it really as a means to an end, and that end is high academic achievement, it's engagement of all kids, access to really robust teaching assessment. If, it's an, if anything's an add-on in a school, it becomes low-hanging. When schedules get tight or money gets tight or whatever the situation may be, it's the first thing. And so what we've done here is the teachers have really done it, the students have really done it, is really three areas. One is sustainability that runs through the second grade through eighth grade program. The second is a focus conceptually based and not just based on topics and facts in isolation or low level skills, but rather lower order thinking skills in service of robust thinking skills. The other is that we've been very intent about selecting instructional practices that students give that kind of experience that LaTanya was hungry for and found and found has found in the environmental program, problem-based learning, project-based learning, uh, inquiry and investigation that is really open-ended and student-driven, uh, in based in other words, where kids are uncovering knowledge and facts and understandings rather than the teacher covering them for him or her. The other is that we've looked at extensively things like expeditionary learning and place-based learning. And so folding those in, again, add on, but where do we see this really tight fit among, and it's a triangle, among the goals, the learning goals that are in the standards, because that's what achievement is measured by in schools. And it really doesn't matter whether you're talking about Virginia and any school across the nation, even charter schools have certain outcomes that they're supposed to achieve with their students. And so where is there a good fit between those outcomes that we've said all kids will achieve, the needs of the individual students, Third rung is where do we align those models and strategies? I'll tell you, it begins with a basic understanding that kids can do this. All kids can do this. Our second graders, our youngest children in the building, are introduced to. You know, if you think about it, the line is this model: social, economic, and, and environmental concepts. So those are the big ideas. They're introduced to that in second grade and they come to third grade where they get that hands-on experience with oysters. And their big idea that they're grappling with are structures. Strategies that they use are focused on teaching the critical thinking and creative problem solving, not as separate entities, but as entities that go together. You can solve a problem in life that you don't use creative thinking and critical thinking together. Our fourth graders are introduced to problem-based learning and project-based learning. The idea is relationships. Our fifth graders study change. What better way to look at sustainability as a thread that runs through than talking about change in the real world? They're introduced to a process called argument-driven inquiry, which is extremely powerful. Our sixth graders study life science and uh, they look at force as a big idea. Our seventh graders study conflict and they 
into inquiry investigation that's student organized and student developed. And then finally, our eighth graders thematically, their big idea is order versus chaos. Um, and if they are, they're doing what we call a capstone project, which is designed to pull all of those big ideas up and have students design and implement a project, which by the way, we even when they go off to high school and college, they continue those. Great. I, um, I, I love the way that you ha can identify the themes that hold everything together at each grade level and how they're, they're scaffolded um, very intentionally. And I think that, um, like you said, most people think that this is an add-on, but all of the themes that you identified are actually, um, standards when we think about education for sustainability. They're, they're how we need to shape how our brain needs to function to be able to get to that systems thinking that is so critical for the future. Um, so this is a big question for you, Kelly, and you just have a little short time, so I want it short and sweet. Um, if Because our goal as the Green Schools National Network is that every school is like your school, um, so what advice um, would you have um, to other building level leaders that to be able to shape a program very similar to yours? I'd build the capacity of time, I'd give them space, I'd give them resources uh, to engage them in that curriculum mapping. That sequence I described uh, was facilitated development the teachers with outside experts, including Mr. Cole, but engage them in curriculum mapping so that they find the connections in their standards to be able to implement uh, the, the triple bottom line in, in a way that's meaningful and authentic and not. The other is engaging students in interest-based opportunities um, and embedded in both of those is the direct development of uh, teaching them to think critically and to problem solve. Great. It's so exciting. I just, when I walk into schools like yours, they just feel, look and feel so different. Um, so thanks for being the visionary at the school level and translating it at the school level. Chris, so you've been, you know, a rabble rouser as an environmental educator, science educator for many years. You, you're close to my heart. Indeed. That's where I started. <laughs> um, so I um, met you when you were creating podcasts about, or was I guess maybe you had started the podcast after we met, um, ex extrapolating and, and exploring how the building is a teaching tool. Um, and you know, over the years, I've continued to watch as you've advanced um, sustainability science in your program. Um, at, with 11th and 12th graders. So how has all of this informed this very unique program that you've got that we now know as the Environmental Studies Program? Um, can you tell us a little bit about it, how it differs, differs from the other high school environmental studies programs that you know we hear about? Um, and what do you he hope to achieve with the program? Absolutely. So the first thing that's really important about this specific environmental studies program is that it's not a school. It's not connected to a school. Um, the amazing thing that all educators know is that students are amazing. You look at Latanya and and just see the the life and change that she's going to make in the world. And the community doesn't always get to see. Them. And if you want to bring someone into a school. Um, that's wonderful. If you want to bring students on a field trip, that's wonderful. But what about the idea of expanding what a classroom looks like and creating a classroom that's not connected to a school, but connected to some of our community partners that really represent what sustainability is all about, like the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And so this program is a classroom that's connected to a nonprofit, a really big nonprofit. And we're sitting here at uh, that spans six states. And we're at the Virginia headquarters. Uh, but this this uh, program is the Virginia headquarters at the Brock Environmental Center uh, of the uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And so that's a really exciting opportunity for students to be able to have 
uh, both deliberate and accidental contact with people that are doing exciting work with sustainability, that are trying to shape our region for the better, and that that are a part of this community. And this, this classroom expansion really grows beyond just the walls of the Brock Environmental Center and this new classroom that's being built, uh, which by the way is the 10th living building in the world of this Brock Environmental Center. So it's just an, an if you think about in a living building as, as possibly the, the most challenging certificate a school or uh, any building can achieve that's related to sustainability and environmental issues. Um, we, we are right here smack in a very, very exciting space uh, that is cutting edge and students get to see that. I mean, just even on a slow walk to go to the bathroom, you're gonna have accidental learning opportunities uh, just walking through the space. And that's really what, what sets this space apart. And when you look beyond the walls of this space, you, you look out of this uh, public access land that surrounds us, this Pleasure House Point natural area, and people are here to, to fish. I, as a matter of fact, I was teaching the other day and, and saw a, a small group of folks come up and get married on the, the deck that I'm standing on today while I was teaching. And you know, uh, the public is all around us doing exciting things. And when students are out here learning and when students are out here doing uh, hands-on activities, the public is curious about that. They see them in action and the students become the authority because the public is gonna come over and ask questions and the students get to shine and share and, and really put a, a face to themselves and what it is that they're trying to do and, and celebrate this public access and celebrate this space with the community all learning together. And that's a really, really exciting opportunity that put students right smack involved in making great change here in Virginia Beach. Could you give us an example of accidental learning? I mean, I know that students right now are virtual, but what are the accidental learning opportunities that you hope to happen when they're sure, in sure. So, Absolutely. So, you know, a, a great example is that, uh, you know, because this is such a cutting edge building, it was the, the first build, first munis municipality in the world to ever also be certified to become a public water works. So they pure all of their own uh, rainwater that falls onto the building to be drinkable. And so this, this system is constantly being monitored, uh, having tests done to it, uh, third parties come in and uh, look at the system and students are able to be a part of that and also uh, just interact with someone while they're walking down the hallway. Uh, this is not just students that are in the space and teachers in the space. Uh, we have uh, both Lynn Haven now that occupies the space, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and all these third party folks that are coming in to look at the wind turbines and, and look at the uh, solar panels and to make sure that everything's working as it's supposed to. And students just walking around the space, seeing uh, all these neat things uh, can't help but, but bump into folks and begin conversations that uh, create connections, create partnerships, and really uh, advance their understanding of the space. I mean, we're connected. Our dock that we share uh, has the uh, oyster barge project uh, that's putting literally billions of oysters into the uh, Chesapeake Bay uh, from Virginia through Maryland. And, and kids, as we're outside uh, often, uh, will be able to be a part of that uh, learning as well. So there's, you know, deliberate intentional acts uh, that we have that are designed, uh, that are classroom experiences or field experiences. But when the public comes up and starts asking us questions, there's the potential for accidental growth, accidental learning to take place and, and a shared experience that's really exciting. And when other people are in the building, uh, you know, we can jump out of the classroom real quick, stop what we're doing and, and go over and learn from them uh, spontaneously and have an accidental learning experience and really to design that into the fundamental structure of where this is located and that's that's a beautiful you mentioned the waterworks you mentioned what wind turbines solar panels the oyster um, flats and all of the other nonprofits um, but you also mentioned the living building now I know that that water works the turbines the solar panels are all part of a living building but the materials, each of the choices and decisions made about the materials that go into that building, can you talk a little bit about that and how that Absolutely. might be leveraged for chemistry or um, physics or um, social science? Um, 
Absolutely. So you know, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation had to do a very intensive dialogue with all of the groups that they were going to be uh, getting materials from. And one great example of this is, is actually connected to the walls of the building. So we have gypsum board here. And typically in, in gypsum board, you have uh, coal fly ash, which is a byproduct of coal fired power plants that comes out. And it, it's uh, quite frankly, pretty terrible for the environment. It has uh, arsenic and, and sulfur dioxide, which creates acid rain and all sorts of, of chemicals that you really wouldn't necessarily want to be in a building. And yet it's found in, in drywall up to 35% in, in, in much of, of gypsum board that people purchase. And it's going into your buildings. Now it's not necessarily getting into the, the space. People aren't necessarily breathing it in, but the idea of having that dialogue and having the Chesapeake Bay Foundation have to reach out to manufacturers and have them actually say, you know what, we can remove that fly ash from our, our process. We can keep that out. We can make a special batch of gypsum board just for you uh, and and we'll, we'll bring that to, as part of the chemical vetting of all the materials that go into the building. And so that's an exciting opportunity and kids get to be a part of that. They get to understand that. Uh, that chemical dialogue is absolutely something that can be connected to how we learn, how students understand chemistry. Uh, and we have equipment that will allow them to look at the air quality inside, outside of the building, to look at the water quality outside the building. And when we're inside and, and things like formaldehyde, off gas, you know, we have uh, equipment that can pick that up. Um, we uh, Volatile organic uh, uh, chemicals can be picked up by uh, the, the air, quality, air quality testing equipment that we have. And so when we're inside this living building, we should not be getting any of those readings. And in fact, when we've turned it on, we don't. But inside many other buildings, uh, we can detect those chemicals. And so, you know, how does that then potentially impact a learner who's breathing those chemicals in? You know, um, there's a lot of really exciting conversations that can be had, ties to the curriculum uh, that empower these students because they're in the forefront of seeing this amazing space. Great. So it's just so, I love the vision all the way down to the action, to the career choices, the career pathways of kids. Um, the, in, the way that this is woven together at Virginia Beach is just beautiful. And, and so I wanna thank you all for this first section. I've got just a little bit of time left and I want to give you each 45 seconds. It's not a lot of time, 30 to 45 seconds. Um, to just what is the one quick recommendation or even aha that you have had that drives your passion that, um, that you can leverage to help other people understand the value of, of what you're doing and how they, they too can leverage um, sustainability. And so we'll start, we'll go from the top um, of the list that um, Brooke has just posted. We'll start with you, Aaron, and we'll end with you, Latanya, <clears throat> this time. So very quick, very brief. Aaron. Okay, 40, 45 seconds. Asking superintendents to be brief is difficult. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, I we mentioned that I grew up here, and one of the stories I like to tell is that when I used to swim in the bay, which was right down the street from my house, you had to wear tennis shoes in the bay because if you didn't, you were going to get bit by blue crabs. They were going to pinch you. And, um, you know, I take my kids to that same beach. My dad still lives there, and we go swimming, and you don't have to wear tennis shoes. Uh, and that's a sign of the troubles in our bay. Uh, and that matters uh, to all of us because that's a sign of bigger problems in our in our communities and in our country uh, and in the world and in our environment. And so this matters to so all the stuff that we've been talking about as educators is really important. And, and we can have these sustainability conversations around the facilities and the products and the processes and, the, and importantly and most importantly, the learning experiences. But at the end of the day, what matters most and the big aha for me and the reason that I always want to keep talking about this is that the future belongs to our students and we've got to help them solve the problems that the adults have created for them. That is amazing. Thanks, Aaron. Tim. For me, the big picture of all of this is that you can get people to understand the uh, interconnectedness and interdependencies of systems. And so, 
how everything operates as a whole. And so if you can do that, then it opens us up for these larger discussions around uh, equity and inclusion and empathy because people start to understand how all of this stuff is related. So, so that's my big takeaway. All of this to me leads toward that ultimate, uh, ultimate goal right there of getting folks to understand this. Great. Thanks, Tim. Kelly. I'm going to say to you that there is nothing more powerful back as an administrator in a building and watching a student give a tour and talk about the sustainable features in the space where they're learning or to watch a group of third graders who've raised oysters all year uh, and some of them do this kiss their oyster and put them out into the bay and or to watch a group of eighth graders who have designed and planned a bus uh, that is the eco bus and they get it they get to tear out the the seats and they get to repurpose them and listening to them give presentations the level of empowerment for students when the learning is in their hands and it is truly it's worthy stuff there's nothing better Great. Chris? All right. So really for me, I, I look at Latanya and, and um, I, I see the, the green fire in her eyes. I, I understand that in, in two short years, she's going to be out in the world making great change and, and, and making this a beautiful, uh, better, more sustainable place to be in. And to have a school system like Virginia Beach uh, double down on trusting their students and to understand that right now they're at a really unique stage in their life where they are so bright, they're so exceptional, and they're generalists. They haven't gone to college and become a specialist in some specific uh, area perhaps with Latonia toxicology, right? And, and, you know, they are problem solvers and are at their peak of creativity. And school systems need to get, like Virginia Beach is doing, get these students involved in building their schools, in uh, dialogue with the community, in making change uh, that is real, that's a tangible thing that these kids can point at and say, I was involved in that. I want to stay in this community because I got involved early, I was engaged in the process of creating, and this building represents a legacy, and I want my younger brothers and sisters to be a part of it. Uh, Latanya is an inspiration, and the school system really is an inspiration for engaging students in this process from the start, and I hope other schools take notice because this is a magic Great. Latanya, you're going to take us out here. Uh, the aha moment for me is like people like you guys giving us the opportunity, like kids my age to come together and work on science and seeing kids doing that. It's like, this is amazing. And science is something that you discover. And you know, there's so much more out in the world. And science is something you got to keep digging in and keep digging. So the aha moment is just seeing everyone work together in science and making a difference in this world. Great. Thank you very much, LaTanya. Um, we are just about at the end of our time. Um, Brooke, are there any burning questions that have emerged um, from our audience or Michelle? There are just a couple. Um, so I will ask those and then I will encourage anyone um, that is listening. If you do have a question, you can go ahead and submit that in the chat box and we will try to address them with the remaining time we have or we will follow up with you individually after. So one of the questions is around connectivity and communication. So Aaron, Kelly, Chris, Tim, from a planning perspective, um, this took a lot of time and intention to make sure that you all were on the same page with fully embracing sustainability so that it wasn't an add-on. Um, can any of you elaborate on how you all communicated with each other in the early stages when this vision was first set and then throughout the process to ensure that everyone was on the same page and working towards the common goal? Maybe Tim or Aaron? So, 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 go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Aaron. 
No, no, I was I, for for me it was it's fairly simple. I mean, I think Tim is kind of the organizer of that common that common vision. If I'm going to be, I mean, and that's the reason, quite frankly, that school divisions should have sustainability officers. Um, but you should all be so lucky to have one who's so passionate and so gifted as ours. Uh, and that's not a recruitment uh, call either, by the way. Um, you know, and, and what Tim's able to do, and I saw this masterfully when ODS was being built, was uh, really connect with Kelly and help support her vision for student learning. So when she talks about kids really understanding their building, it's because before they ever moved into that building, they had been working with Tim through Zoom, learning about the features of that building and getting excited about what that meant for the environment and being able to talk about the science behind that. Um, you know, for Tim and I, I think we've just always had this kind of shared connection. I, uh, I honestly, uh, I'll tell the story super quickly where Chris is sitting right now, where Latanya's sitting right now. In fact, the room she's sitting in, uh, I was at a reception there one night and Tim was there and I looked around and I said, my gracious, this is a beautiful, incredible place filled with scientists and policymakers, and our kids should have a classroom here. And, you know, you, you get somebody like Tim and he, he hears that and he runs with that. And the next thing you know, you got Chris Freeman running a class, a classroom in that facility because collectively we just all believe this is the right thing to do for kids. So I don't, the, the coordination has to happen with, you have to have a person who gets up every day and thinks about this. And we have that in our sustainability officer. And I believe that about any school division and any work, you, you, in any organization, you have to have somebody who gets up every day and thinks about that thing. Uh, and, and so because we have that, I think it makes our coordination and communication fairly um, powerful and productive. Anything to add, Tim, as the cheerleader? So, so I would just say that uh, the, the person who's doing that, uh, you just have to be have to be persistent with it. You have to do stuff as uh, we like to do pilot programs. And also, I know a lot of people think they have a good idea and they want to broadcast that idea. But a lot of times when you do that, it just gets shot down. So uh, you're much better off just doing whatever and implementing whatever idea you have. And then it's much better to ask for forgiveness later than permission to do something the first time around. So that would be uh, what I would say you, you have to emphasize as the person wanting to put that forward. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm going to reinforce what both Tim and Aaron have said. We, with our districts around the country, there is, in each of those districts that are really leveraging this, there is a person or a, you know, cadre of people who take this vision and hold it um, for the district. And so the leadership summit that we piloted um, with, Virginia Beach was within partnership with the Harvard School of Public Health. And we've now um, replicated that leadership summit with 20 school districts and schools across the country. And the projects that have emerged from those summits from with all of these schools and school districts are inspiring. Um, everything from incorporating the sustainable, sustainable development goals throughout the curriculum to um, place projects, um, problem-based learning maps that are reflective of what Kelly is doing, um, career technology, education um, pathways for green careers are emerging in all of our work. Um, but most important is that visionary leadership, that, that collaborative and visionary leadership that comes from the top that empowers people. Um, and the articulation we've done, we do idea mapping, idea flow mapping when a concept emerges and do the problem solving um, around what might, what the conflicts might be and pilot, like Tim said, we pilot projects um, and then grow them. And so that process is becoming very successful and we're replicating it across the country. That's the work we do. <laughs> We learn from our partners and take it out to the world. So. Perfect. And that was actually the answer to the next question. So um, I think we are we are good to wrap. So Jenny, any final, final comments? Just a big thank you to our panelists um, for taking this time to join us. Um, I am always awed and inspired by our partners. And for those of you that have been able to join us, I, I, haven't, I don't get to see your faces, but 
Um, if you have any questions, please, um, Jay Seidel at greenschoolsnationalnetwork.org, drop me a note um, and um, get involved. We also have a free publication that you can leverage um, if you go to greenschoolsnationalnetwork.org and look at the top of the bar where it says the Catalyst Quarterly. Um, that is a free journal. It's the only peer-reviewed journal in the country for um, green, healthy, equitable schools. Um, and we just published a special issue on COVID and why sustainability is even more important in the time of COVID. So. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you for that. And we will send out links um, to the um, documents and website that Jenny just mentioned um, to all of our participants. And certainly, again, thank you to our panelists very much for your time um, and sharing your story and experiences. We greatly appreciate it. And certainly thank you to Jenny for being our fantastic um, discussion host and representing the Green Schools National Network. Um, just one final quote um, that I think Jenny will um, also smile with to leave you all with is from um, Jane Goodall, which hopefully everyone um, is familiar with Jane's incredible work. Um, but we hope that you all can get inspired by this quote and also by this conversation to really pay attention to all of the choices that you were making in your daily lives um, and really focusing on the impact that it's making in your current day um, but also, more importantly, the impact that it's making in future generations. So as Jane Goodall says, um, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So thank you, everyone. Thank you much. Thank you. Are we recording any longer?